let's uh, let's start. Um, so again, welcome everyone. My name is Agata Morka. I am communications officer at Spark Europe, and uh, we are here today uh, for um, the second. It's actually our second webinar in a series of webinars, um, which are devoted to the SCOS third pledging round. And in this round, we have three amazing open science infrastructures, Archive, Redalic America, and DSpace. Um, so today, during this session, um, what will happen? So first of all, I will give you a very short in intro to uh, SCOS. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you might be already familiar with what SCOS is and what SCOS does, but this will be just really in a nutshell what we are. Uh, who we are and what we do. Um, then I will turn over um, to uh, the infrastructures. So each infrastructure will have 15 minutes uh, for their presentations. And then we will have a short panel discussion with all the representatives of, of each infrastructure, but also with the SCOS board members, because we are very happy to have here with us today two uh, SCOS board members. Uh, so um, welcome to Susan. Susan, hi who is representing the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. Hello, Susan. And also hello to Judy Rutenberg, who is representing the uh, ARL, uh, ARL, sorry, so the Association of Research Libraries. Um, after this short panel discussion, it's all about you, about the audience, about the participants of this meeting. So if you have any questions, that would be your time to, to ask them. And I am really very much hoping for a lively discussion here. Feel free to put your um, questions uh, in a chat window, or if you would like to um, ask them in a more personal way, so to speak, as personal as you can get on a Zoom meeting, um, then please just unmute yourself and feel free to, to ask questions. Uh, so I suppose off we go. I will start sharing my screen now and give you a short introduction to SCOS. Um, so here we go. And uh, the first slide here. So SCOS, first of all, the acronym stands for the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. And um, why, why did we come into existence? So SCOS was officially formed in 2017. And um, it was mainly because we, we we noticed that there was a certain challenge when it comes to open science infrastructure. So there were many open infrastructures created, but they were created, created, created mainly using short-term project money. Um, and there were, they were, of course, uh, facing issues with uh, sustainability. Um, so um, it, is also, um, it also happens very often that funding in general for operation, operations is neglected. And at the same time, um, of course, what uh, at least what, what our vision was, uh, was this equitable and inclusive research culture uh, in which everyone could participate, which of course is great, but at the same time, how can we make sure that um, all of these new projects that uh, were popping up, that they are sustainable? So uh, what our aim was at SCOS uh, was to come up with a structure that could somehow um, help sustain the infrastructure um, to uh, support the implementation of open science. Um, so what we came up with um, is a certain way of facilitating um, cost sharing framework that uh, will, would ultimately enable the broader open access and open science community to support the non-commercial services on which it depends. So this is how it all started with SCOS. Again, in 2017, uh, we are now well into our third pledging round. Um, we already issued the expression of interest for the fourth pledging round. And I am very happy um, to say that um, at the moment, we managed to, um, in total funds, to gather almost 4 million euro for open science infrastructure. And so, um, what is also important about SCOS is that we are not a payment agency. We do not uh, ourselves collect money 
all we do is we facilitate dialogue, we facilitate connections, we make connections between infrastructures in need of funding and potential pledgers, potential funding. Um, so uh, this is a little scheme here that shows you uh, how it all works. Um, so pretty much what we do, we issue each year an expression of interest for infrastructures that are in, inter that are in need for funding. They apply to SCOS, then we go through a very elaborate vetting process and we arrive at um, sometimes three, sometimes two infrastructures that we would like to represent in each pledging round. And then um, we engage um, individual institutions, we engage consortia, we engage libraries um, in this um, common effort of pledging for these, for these infrastructures. So uh, SCOS, uh, of course, we have many members and some of our members are um, quite um, large organizations. As you can see, we have Carl on board, on board, we have Cowell on board, we have Eiffel. Uh, we also have the French Ministry of um, Education, Research and Innovation. So um, lots, of infra lots of institutions um, um, actually recognize the importance of what SCOS is doing and we are very happy to be collaborating with them. So pledges to date, as I mentioned, we almost hit the 4 million euros um, mark. And I am allowed to unofficially um, say it's really hot off the press news that uh, a European country has just today pledged um, to six chosen infrastructures um, who are under the SCOS umbrella, and that will help <coughs> us hit the 4 million euro uh, mark, which I, we are all very excited about. Um, so far, over two, 290 institutions pledged from 22 different countries. And so far, we have supported eight infrastructures. So um, in the first cycle, the pilot cycle, we supported Sherpa Romeo and DOAJ. DOAJ has reached its uh, pledging target, its pledging target, while Sherpa Romeo is still, uh, is still getting there. We are currently on the 43% with them, but very much hoping that um, they will hit their, their target. Um, for the second funding cycle, we had three different infrastructures. So we had DOAB and OAPEN, um, and they also reached their target last year, uh, which we're very happy about. And then we have two more infrastructures who are still, um, still fighting to, to get um, to, their, uh, to their target. So we have open citations and PKP, so the public knowledge project. They are um, around at around 40% each uh, of their, of their pledging, pledging target. And last year in September, we launched the third funding cycle. And in this cycle, we also have three infrastructures. So we have Archive, we have Redalic America, and we have DSpace. And um, thanks to a very recent pledge coming from Canada, um, that was our first pledge, first, first pledge coming from a consortium um, uh, for this uh, third funding, funding cycle. And that placed Archive at 15% of their target. Redalic America is at 8% currently, and this place is at 10%. So we are very, very much hoping that we can boost these numbers here. Um, so right now, I will give the floor to the infrastructures themselves, because who better to talk about what it, what it is that they do, um, what it is that they're um, struggling with, uh, than the infrastructures themselves. So I will start with Archive, and I would like to invite Alison from, from Archive to present, to present Archive. Alison, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the time uh, that you're spending with all of us today. Um, so Archive is an open platform um, that researchers around the world use to share and discover um, emerging science and also establish their contribution um, to advancing research. We have a 30 year history in digital open access. Um, we're now uh, hosting more than 2 million scholarly articles. We passed that mark in December and um, super excited about it. We cover eight major subject areas and um, the most uh, 
the subjects that cover the most um, content on archive are um, computer science, math, and physics. Um, but we also cover economics and statistics um, and uh, some others. So uh, services include article submission, compilation, production, we, um, search and discovery. We distribute um, uh, the articles over uh, the internet. Um, there's also API distribution um, and we curate the collection. So it's not peer reviewed, um, but it is curated by a group of volunteer moderators. Our guiding principles are openness, collaboration, scholarship, and interoperability. Um, and I also should mention that we're based at Cornell University. Next slide. So how does archive work? Um, from the perspective of an individual researcher, you can start over there on the left. Um, the author you know, ha has completed a research project. They have a paper to submit. They go online. They submit it through archive.org. Um, and then it comes into our system. In our system, uh, we have uh, this group of uh, volunteer moderators from around the world. There are more than 200 of them um, who volunteer their time to us and the, and the paper. So they check the paper for basic quality measures. And we also have some automated checks that the papers go through. Then a uh, full text PDF is produced online. Um, and this happens uh, five days a week. And um, emails listing the new papers are sent out to subscribers. Um, and I'm also super, super excited to announce, um, just this week we announced that um, Archive is now uh, registering DOIs with Datasite. So each paper receives a DOI that, um, it's, it's funny, so in the, uh, in the past, ever since our founding in 1991, um, we, uh, we gave each paper an archive ID. This was before the concept of DOIs even existed. <laughs> and, um, and that was a stable way to identify the paper. So that was super useful. But now we found of course that DOIs because they're used across different platforms, um, the DOIs help, help uh, archive become you know, more integrated with the scholarly communications landscape. So, um, so from there, you know, the papers are read and used by researchers around the world um, to discover new ideas, inspire new research, and the cycle continues. Um, I also want to mention that outside of archive, papers might be published in conventional journals, they might be published in overlay journals, they might be used in grant applications, and we have um, several different licenses that authors can choose from so that they can satisfy requirements of journals or funders. Um, that, that they, you know, that they need to be um, in compliance with. Next slide. All right, so our, our governance structure, as I said, we're based at Cornell University um, and we are led by a director, a scientific director and our small staff of, um, of 12. And then we are advised by the member advisory board and the scientific advisory board. So um, members who, you know, institutions that contribute to us are eligible to be on the member advisory board. That's one of the benefits of membership. Next. All right, so our usage. Um, we've had more than 2 billion downloads since 1991. We have about 35 million downloads per month now. As I said, we just passed the 2 million mark for articles. Um, and you can see this um, from this graph here that submissions to archive are just <laughs> rising exponentially. And to us, that's, that's super exciting because it shows that the services that we're providing are really valued by the research community. Um, we look at it, you know, we don't do peer review, but um, we look at, at the way researchers use archive as being part of the research process. It's a way to get early feedback on work. It's a way to archive their finished work. Um, so, you know, as you can see by the submissions, uh, researchers value that service. So, um, and also submissions originate from 140 countries around the world. 
So <laughs> this is, I know you can't re really read this, but um, this is just a snapshot of submission rank. And I, I tried to focus on North America, but it's, it's definitely not complete. It's just to give you a sense. Um, so those are lists of names of institutions and the submission rank. So when you look at, you know, where, which institutions are, are submitting um, papers, uh, you know, we can, um, we can rank those. Um, that's a, that's a type of usage that we pay attention to. And actually what I want to do, if I can, is um, share in the chat. Uh, there, we have data from 2020 on usage that includes downloads and submissions by institution. You can search for your own institution there. Um, so I'm just putting that in the chat now. And we don't have the numbers for 2021 yet, but we expect to have that in, um, in a couple months for our members. So go ahead and, and switch the slide. All right, so our su sustainability issues. Um, as you can see, <laughs> archive submissions have increased exponentially, but our ad admin staffing levels have remained roughly the same. We actually only have four people on staff who um, handle the submissions process. And, um, and we're really feeling the strain of that as the submissions increase. Also, parts of the service rely on decades old code that is not robust or, mod, um, or scalable. And it's, uh, and so we're in this process of, of rewriting um, old code to make it more modern and, um, and uh, uh, interoperable like microservices that, um, that we can update instead of a code base that's sort of every part is reliant on another part. Um, so funding will support open source code, modernized user interfaces, um, streamlined workflows, moving to the cloud. In fact, that's one of our major priorities this year is moving everything to the cloud. Um, we still have some on-premises uh, services. And so in doing, in making all these changes, we're prioritizing maintainability, evolvability, uh, flexibility, and again, this in enhanced interoperability um, with other services. So um, you can see here our pledging target. We have um, different levels for contribution level um, contribution amounts. We, we um, suggest that institutions who want to become members are um, uh, contribute based on their submission usage. Um, so that's why we have the data available online. So for example, like if your institution is in the top 100 institutions around the world submitting to archive, we, um, we suggest a $5,000 a year contribution. Um, oh, and I should mention that on that previous slide, many of those institutions are actually already contributing. So thank you, huge thanks if you're on this call and you're already contributing to Archive. <laughs> We're super grateful. Um, uh, I should mention too that we have the champion level, which is for institutions maybe that have a special open access fund. They are really committed to supporting Archive at a high level. Um, perhaps they're um, an institution whose researchers really um, really rely on archive um, to do their work. We suggest a higher contribution for those, those institutions. And then we also have the community level because of course we understand that many institutions are facing financial hardship because of COVID and whatnot. Um, so we always have the option to contribute at a lower level if you're financially strapped. Um, and I also wanna take this opportunity to thank um, the Big Ten uh, decided to, to contribute at the champion level this year. So thank you, thank you. Um, California Digital Libraries also agreed to um, contribute at the champion level this year. And we're so happy to welcome um, the Canadian Research Knowledge Network um, that's joining for the first time this year. So um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. And that's it. Thank you so much, Alison. Um, if there are any questions at this point, uh, please please put them in the, in, in our chat because I think that uh, as I as I said, uh, we will have time dedicated for for questions, especially unless someone has 
a, an immediate question that just came to their mind and they're just dying to ask archive at the moment that's also fine just please make sure that you put it in in the chat window um so far i don't i don't see anything so i guess let's proceed uh so now over to readily kamalika and i would like to invite ariana basiril garcia to present on the on behalf of Redalik and Amelika. Ariana, welcome. Thank you very much, Agatha. Uh, and thank you, Scos, and all of you uh, for being here and make uh, this campaign possible. Uh, today, I would like to introduce uh, one platform and one initiative. Uh, which, uh, well, uh, uh, the both, both of them started in the Latin American region. Uh, but now uh, we are working with other regions as well. In the case of Redalic, Redalic is an, uh, a journal index and also an article hosting platform and now committed to Diamond Open Access Journal Publishing. Uh, so we index quality journals that are non-APC journals and we provide different services that complement the capabilities that um, the, the Diamond Open Access Journals uh, already have. Uh, uh, well, we have almost 1,500 um, open access peer review journals indexed in our, our platform from a little bit more uh, than 700 institutions, mainly universities, uh, well, yeah, academic institutions in general, uh, from 31 countries. We also index the full text and provide different services in terms of discoverability. Uh, we uh, our target is to reach one million full text articles this year. Uh, the articles that we currently have are from uh, uh, around two million authors from practically all over the world that are uh, publishing in the journals indexed in in Redalic. The case of Amelika, uh, well, it is an association that has started. Um, well, it is so much younger than Redalic. Redalic started in 2002, and Amelika it started in 2018. And it is an uh, association of different universities and institutions to coordinate efforts to, to support non-commercial, uh, non-commercial scholarly communications in terms of uh, well different services. So the idea is to provide next, please, uh, Agata, to provide different services that can add value to Diamond Open Access and that can meet and address different needs that uh, journal publishing uh, in the non-commercial sector is uh, facing. So we started with um, a, a quality se selection, uh, which is um, we have different well uh, quality criteria to assess the quality of the journal. Uh, where, of course, the non-APC uh, requirement is mandatory. And also, it has uh, the, the journal uh, has to be uh, strong in terms of peer, re peer review, in terms of transparency, and many other editorial issues that are assessed at this, uh, at this point of quality. So after that, uh, after this um, uh, evaluation that the journal needs to uh, approve, uh, it passes uh, to a qualitative assessment made by an international uh, council, uh, which is composed of different people from different areas, experts in different fields from different countries, so they can give a uh, qualitative uh, feedback on the journal in order to be indexed in Redalic. After that, we provide a set of uh, tools and different services, for example, in terms of the uh, editorial workflow in, uh, in order to help them to produce XML and PDF and HTML and EPUF in, uh, for every article they are publishing uh, without any cost. So they can use this um, workflow tools to lower the costs of journal production. And at the same time, we are providing different uh, visibility and discoverability services uh, to help them to uh, be widespread uh, around the world. Uh, so we provide, for example, the integration uh, of Diamond Open Access Journals with institutional repositories, with regional repositories, with thematic repositories, for example, and also with libraries and also with different search engines. So a journal that, that that it's publishing in the non-commercial sector uh, can be distributed around the world in their 
well, academic channels and library channels so to be more visible. We also provide uh, different metrics so journals can um, track the, their usage, the visibility, and also to provide different uh, well ways to compare the community of authors that are participating in each journal and the community of researchers who are consuming the, the literature that is published, published by the journal. And also metrics that can help also uh, well decision makers to to, to see how, uh, for example, the productivity of the researchers, how they are publishing in Diamond Open Access Journals, which is uh, for us very important to let people know that uh, Diamond Open Access is playing an important role. So we provide this kind of metrics for institutions, also for countries. And we are also exploring some services in, in, in linked open data. So we have different collections that are transversal to uh, the Diamond Open Access Journals in order to provide, for example, collections in terms of gender studies and also, uh, for example, with um, a, a ODS from, uh, on, from the Agenda 2030. And all these collections are uh, published in linked open data. So these are, well, the general uh, services uh, infrastructure that we are providing for Diamond Open Access Journals. Next one, please, Agatha. And in the case, very briefly, of Amelika, so we work together in order to provide a, like a framework a, for different institutions to take advantage of non-commercial uh, open access publishing, but also we are extending the technologies to books, uh, the workflows, for example, and also we are covering other branches of open science, for example, the particular case of a community of open uh, of the uh, users of the OJS platform, which is one platform that is very or widely used by uh, journals. For example, we have now a, a little bit more than 600 people registering the community of users and developers of OJS. So they are contributing a code and, and well, a feedback and knowledge around that. So we have different, for example, Aura is another service that is provided by uh, journals the Diamond Journals, which is to um, make their policies in terms of archiving visible. So people can know uh, the, the policies in terms of archiving and author rights for a uh, Diamond Open Access Journals. Next one, please, Agatha. Uh, this is our governance structure. Uh, well, we started as an academic project inside a university, the, the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico, which is very important to highlight uh, because Redalic uh, uh, it, it is part of, a, of an academic project. So it started like that, but we are uh, consolidating our governance structure in terms of um, inviting different stakeholders that participate in the uh, decision-making processes, for example. Uh, and also we have uh, started this contributors committee. Uh, at the time we uh, are participating at, uh, with this cause. This is uh, very new for us because we have been sustained mainly by uh, grants and uh, by money from universities in terms of uh, academic agreements and some other kind of uh, uh, agreements related to academic and research projects. So we are consolidating our platform. And in the case of Amelica, which is a civil association registered in Mexico, uh, we have different institutions uh, that are uh, participating. Uh, they are led by, in this case, by Claxo and Redalic, with the support at the beginning from UNESCO as well. Thank you, uh, Agatha. One more, thank you. Uh, about the usage, um, we have, well, we have, as, as I said before, articles from uh, authors from all over the world, since they are using or publishing in journals, in Diamond Open Access journals, of course. Uh, for the case of uh, the United States, we are, we have uh, 70,000 articles published in, in our journals, which are full text. And we have well different metrics. For example, this one that shows us that, uh, for example, there's a co-authorship of the United States with 87 uh, countries around the world. So we can find 
here, for example, which articles in which fields, and also read the text. So this is, for example, the, uh, the publishing in the, 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 the articles authored by uh, US people, for example. The next one, please, um, Agatha. And this is a case of Canada. Uh, well, we have a lot of collaboration and we, we have seen that uh, there are a lot of uh, articles that are published not only in English, but also coming from North America, but also in Spanish and Portuguese, which is uh, one of the main languages that we are working on. Next one, please. Uh, this is our global usage. Uh, we are providing this service and we have uh, around 12 million average articles downloads per month, uh, which is, uh, and, and it's increasing very, very often, uh, especially during the pandemic time. Uh, so uh, our capacity in our server infrastructure is one of the issues that I'm going to talk uh, about because it is not enough to meet this um, workload of, of users. Uh, we have almost 30 million users, unique users, per year. So we have a really, really high, high demand. And uh, at the time we are indexing more uh, journals from other countries. Now we have also the need to have better um, uh, internet speed, for example, for other regions, which uh, it wasn't uh, our original need, but now we have to attend some of, the, of, of that issues. For example, uh, many users are coming uh, uh, from Africa to, uh, to, to, to read the articles that are in Redalic. So we have to, to improve also the connectivity uh, among uh, regions. Okay, thank you. Well, this is our uh, users worldwide. You can see perhaps we have more um, engagement from users coming from the Spanish or Portuguese speaking countries. But this is really moving since we are open now to other countries in terms of journal indexing. So uh, this is now moving very, very fast. Thank you, Agatha, the next one. Okay, we have, uh, in, well, in two years, we almost reached 1 million users, for example, from the United States, which is, uh, you can see, for example, the regions perhaps that are closer to Mexico uh, are the ones that are uh, more active in the platforms, uh, but, uh, but we have a, a lot of demand from uh, the United States. Next one, uh, Agatha. This is the case of Canada as well. Next one, please. Now, while well, regarding our sustain sustainability issues, as I mentioned, uh, we have an infrastructure of services which is, well, nearly obsolete and also uh, well, insufficient for our current demand. Uh, our communication devices and bandwidth and everything which is in a data center in the, in the university, which is a public university in Mexico, it is, well, not enough uh, to, to meet the demand. So these circumstances is, are, are causing that the services um, are not the best, don't have the best uh, response uh, of speed and uh, availability sometimes. Uh, and many, for example, many journals now are uh, uh, basing or are uh, relying in Reda League to produce their electronic uh, formats of the journals. So if we stop our service, we really impact, for example, many journals that are producing uh, the, the electronic files, for example, in Redalic. So for us, it's very important to always uh, keep operating. So uh, we have at a high risk of presenting technical deficiencies. Um, and the idea is that uh, the campaign coming from SCOS and uh, the pledges it could help us to strengthen the technical infrastructure, particularly the services, communication devices and bandwidth services that uh, will contribute not only to our uh, availability online, but also to strengthen the infrastructure that uh, help us to keep innovating and to keep developing soft software and to keep uh, you know, producing and generating the metrics and all the background processes that are that perform a, a, in, the, in the backstage of Redalic. So we need to upgrade this infrastructure in order to, 
to, to keep operating and to keep being competitive. Next one, please. Well, this, this is our target. Well, I, we need this only to um, update our, in our infrastructure. And these are our uh, suggestions for contribution. I have to say that we are very flexible in terms of, uh, well, the, the periodicity of, of the contribution and also about, about the amounts, but this is our original uh, suggestions for organizations that are uh, for, from high income, income countries or the small organizations or funding organizations. But, uh, well, uh, we are very flexible with that. If you are interested, please contact uh, me or directly to Revelic. We, we have a form also in the web page. I will leave you the, the link. And well, I think I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ariana. And I think that there is already a question for you actually in the chat window, and it has to do with Cielo. So what is, how does uh, Redelic America relate to Cielo? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Well, we are different initiatives. Uh, Cielo started in Brazil. Uh, and Redalic started in Mexico, and we started working with uh, Latin America. So we have similar models, but uh, perhaps uh, today the, the main uh, difference is that Redalic is committed only to index Diamond Open Access Journals, which is something that is different from Cielo, which accept, accept uh, also um, APC journals, for example. Uh, but uh, and now Redalic work not only with the Latin American region. We are working with Africa, India, and some uh, also countries from Europe. So uh, these are the main differences uh, between the two platforms. Thank you so much for clarifying, Karyana. Uh, I don't see any more questions for now. I'm sure that there will be more coming. Um, but for now, uh, over to Michele uh, from DSpace. So Michele Mignelli, and he's going to present DSpace for us. And just give me a second, Michele. I will put your slide on. There you go. Thanks, Agatha. And uh, thanks, Klaus, obviously, for organizing uh, this, uh, this webinar and, uh, and, and this meeting. And thanks, all of you, for, for being here. And particularly because North America is, is um, uh, one of the largest contributor of our community. So thanks, thank you in advance. Um, uh, due to the, the, the large number of DSpace installations out there, you might have uh, heard of DSpace already, uh, but I, I hope I'll give you some, some new uh, perspectives and ideas with these uh, with these slides. Uh, so as I mentioned, this space is is uh, most likely the, the most adopted uh, repository around the world. Um, it's an open source repository platform. It's been it's been out there for for a few years now, and uh, over 30, 3,000 installations that we know of. Um, based on the registry of, of, of this space, but most likely there are many more than that. And uh, it's free to use, free to download, and it's, uh, it's a community-led uh, program and it's based on community contribution. So uh, it's ex extremely important for us to have the chance to uh, reach out to the community of users and, uh, and explain why it is important they, they are part of, of all of this. Uh, I'm going to please next slide. Now, I want to start the, this, this presentation uh, uh, thinking, I mean, talking about uh, different concepts. I mean, uh, because the idea the governance is working on, uh, the, the DSpace governance is working on, is to rethink the, the role of repositories in our, in our ecosystem. Uh, because for several reasons that are happening out there, and, and uh, some are uh, definitely impactful for our life as well, uh, the repositories themselves are, are, are getting kind of a new life. So when, when we think about an open infrastructure as, as the open source uh, DSpace repository, we have to consider many different aspects, as, as you probably know. Uh, one is obviously that it's part of a broader uh, ecosystem. There's the research life cycle because it serves the institutions in different ways and deposit uh, uh, papers and publications. 
uh, then if it's open, you need to consider the protocols and the standards of different technologies in order to interoperate with other systems that are, that are out there. Um, you're part of an even broader ecosystem, which is the academic ecosystem in general, and the, uh, where, where the repositories are usually used. Um, you have to build the software, you have to provide some services. And then the, the concept of op openness is, uh, is again, is broader than, than what we have been used to in, in the past 20 years, I would say, when you started with the idea of, it is an open source, of course, and uh, uh, everything started particularly with, uh, with this space, with the idea of open access. Now it is about open science, which is broader, open data. Um, then you need to be open to other systems and to interoperability and API. It's, it's a good way to exchange data and information. Uh, it's open in terms of open mind because the people behind the repository, especially for the, for the purpose that the repository serve, uh, they're, they're very much uh, open-minded people trying to, to work in an interconnected world. Uh, systems should be open. Um, uh, it's open because it's global, so anyone can access it from anywhere around the world. And because we are creating a global community here, and so on, because it, it is also community built. Uh, it's open in terms of the governance is open and it's transparent uh, so that anyone can chip in and, and be part of the decision-making process. Uh, next slide, uh, Agatha, please. Uh, so um, um, I mentioned that the repository is part of a, a broader ecosystem and um, the idea it is somehow to uh, rethink the role of repository, as I mentioned. So the repository, uh, for, for many years, it's it's been a place where you store uh, publications or, or and and, uh, and papers, and um, uh, but uh, for each one of them, there's so much more uh, involved uh, because it's a place where ideas are stored. It's it's a place where research is made and shared and. And, and discussed, uh, it's a place where researchers meet and, and learn something new. It's a place where you share the information you have. And when all of this becomes uh, uh, a, a, some sort of interoperable system or interconnected, all these pieces of data becomes information, valuable information for institutions to manage and to make decision uh, on, on, on top of them and uh, using them because uh, you can have uh, links to all the other systems in the, in the institutions that can feed the repository and the repository can feed them back uh, with, valuable, with valuable data information. And at the end of the day, it becomes a strategic tool for the institution themselves. Uh, next slide, please. And so be, before I get a little bit more into the space itself, uh, this is basically a disclaimer for my own uh, presentation. Um, so the governance of this space, which uh, I, I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, is very focusing on switching the role of repositories now. And uh, the, the latest release, this space 7, really moves toward that direction, adopting um, uh, the recommendations, the, 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 the global recommendations that are coming from uh, international organizations in order uh, to develop something that is really up to, up to date in terms of uh, standards and protocols. Because uh, as I mentioned uh, before, the repository is a strategic tool for, for institutions that supports the mission of them. And it's not just a static uh, um, a place where you archive uh, data, but it's uh, it's uh, what I call a data agora, where where data meets and becomes something more and more useful. Um, when we build up a repository, when we when we improve this space, uh, we can consider it as a standalone technology because it's obviously part of, of an ecosystem or an infrastructure that is, that is broader than a, a piece of repository. Um, we have always to look at the big picture and try to create partnership with other organizations in order to understand uh, what's new and uh, how to bring the repositories to the next level. And uh, we always have to keep an eye open, uh, talking about openness, uh, for standards and protocols, and, and most importantly, 
uh, when we talk about open source as all the technologies we're talking about here and, and everything that's cost supports, we need to look at them as a collective responsibility. So obviously they're free, obviously they're available, but they are there for a reason. And they're there because you're here as well uh, to support them. So that's, that's the kind of a framework that we want to support. Next slide, please. So the, 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 how this, this platform uh, survive uh, and how this is, this is try somehow to, to move ahead is, as I mentioned, this space is a community led uh, program. It's always been like this. So um, uh, it's the members and the users who contribute to think about the future of the technology, where it should go and how. Uh, it should go there, it should get there. So anything is about the community. They, they contribute code, they, they contribute money, and they contribute ideas. And uh, the, the ideas go through different uh, vehicles and paths, and uh, finally they get to the leadership group. And the leadership group is a members-based organization uh, structure, and they are the ones who, who make the final decisions on, on this space and approves or rejects what the steering group present. The steering group is a subgroup of the leadership. Um, today, there are over 20 leaders uh, in this space from over 10 different countries. Uh, I, I'll get to the, to the distribution of countries later on, but this is one of the strengths of this space. As a global organization present in over 120 countries, it's important to have that kind of representation. Um, there are different ways to get involved. It's not just the governance, it's also the different working groups and, and user groups. Next slide, please. I mentioned the global, the global uh, usage and distribution of the space, and I mentioned that, that, that we know of 3,000 inst installations around the world. But it's even more important for us is that there are at least 120 countries where this space is currently used. And that's why it is important to think about it as a global infrastructure. If we manage to make them all connected somehow, uh, the, I mean, the, the strength of the platform will be even, even stronger, even higher. And uh, there are currently, uh, this space is, is developed in 20 different languages, uh, which is uh, it's just a great result. And out of those 120 countries, in, in, a, in a few of them, like a, a small percentage, if we think of, of it, but uh, we have established user groups, national user groups that are helping us moving the project forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, and this is what I mentioned about the user groups. Uh, this is something new. Uh, we started working on it uh, uh, 20 years ago because basically we, we found out that um, uh, this space as a community, it was, uh, uh, it was formed by several different communities. So we, we refer to it as a community of communities. Because even if we didn't know about uh, them, they existed in different countries. And so what we're trying to do is to create engagement uh, with the different national communities to bring their ideas and needs and, and expectations of, from the software uh, to the governance. And not all of them obviously are part of, of the decision-making process, but in this way, we're trying to open up the access to, to, to this process. We're trying to organize lots of events and webinars. Uh, obviously, in the past two years, there have been more webinars than in-person events uh, for uh, obvious reasons. Um, but we try to um, uh, translate documentation in different languages for the users and for the developers, trying to engage in conversation with them. We're trying to bring uh, information to, to different countries. So a big thank to all the national user group coordinators they're doing a fantastic job in helping us reaching out to the, to the users and supporting them. Um, uh, obviously, this space, as, as I mentioned, is a global platform. Uh, it's important to, for, 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 the, for the community to create partnership and relationship with other uh, organizations um, uh, in the world. Uh, we are partnering with, with a few, which are extremely important for our ecosystem. As some of them I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, La Referencia in Latin America, uh, Core, Open Air, and Eurocris, they're all part of the same ecosystem or trying to support uh, openness in many different forms and all try to support research activities in many different forms. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the usage of the US uh, uh, based on our uh, um, registry. 
um, the country with the highest number of installation is actually the United States, and it is also the, the, the country that provides more members to this space. So a big thank to, to the US, there are 326 reported instances, there might be more, there might be less, we're trying to, to work on the registry in order to make it up to date. Uh, next slide is about uh, Canada, uh, with 47 self-reported uh, uh, installations, including uh, three consortia that are a very big contributor to the community. Because if we look at this the next slide, it's about the, the pie that presents all the users in the world and, um, and also relationship to the mem in relation to the membership and the governance. We see that uh, in, in North America, there's a ratio of one to 10. So every 10 users that's a member, this is a fantastic ratio. It's by far the best ratio we have in the different, in the different countries. Um, as you can see, most of the users are, are in Europe or in Latin America or in Asia, and the ratio there is, is much smaller. And this is one of the issues. So the next, the next slides about the challenges we're facing um, in order to make this program sustainable. Uh, one is the large community. So it's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic added value for, for the project and for the software itself. But it's also very hard to, to manage, especially because many institutions, they don't have uh, access to membership or they're not, they're not providing any kind of support. And so most of the big institutions are, are, are trying to support uh, what we're doing. So we need to broaden up uh, the, the participation, the membership, and its cost is really, really helpful for that. Uh, the other problem is with the technology itself. Uh, the last release, which was by far the largest release in the history of this space, um, uh, it took us a long time because there haven't been um, a much technical and development contribution uh, as we expected, because we are relying on the support of a couple of service providers, which are fantastic because they allow us to, to move the platform forward, but we need more contribution from the technical side as well. And, uh, and the membership model in some countries uh, is under pressure. And, uh, and so we need to find different ways and different paths to support um, uh, uh, open source platforms that, as, as I mentioned before, are, are collective responsibilities. Um, so uh, through the support of SCOFs, we, we want to get to the point of being able to hire a community manager and to hire a, a junior a junior developer for this space in order to support those, those three aspects. Uh, last slide, this is about the pledging. And uh, I mean, uh, we are here to, to try to get some extra support. Uh, I mentioned the reasons why you're looking for it and uh, there are many other reasons that we don't have time to go through uh, all of them now. There are different options and as uh, per uh, uh, every uh, project uh, supported by SCOS, we have obviously also discount for consortium membership. And, uh, and uh, if you have other questions, we will be happy to uh, answer. And uh, you can contact us at this space, uh, at uh, Thank you very much again for being here. I uh, hope to hear from you soon. Thank you so much, Michaela, for this. Uh, thank you for all the presentations. Um, Michaela, I have to say it was very inspiring, especially the slide about the uh, data agora. I loved it. Um, and also about the fact that we have a collective responsibility over open source. Um, let me kick off the discussion here. And for all the people who are in the meeting, please feel free to, to add your questions to, to our chat or just to unmute yourself and then jump in. But I would like to start um, with our board members here. So um, I have a question to Susan and Judy um, about the vetting process. So um, this is at the very core of what SCOS does. Uh, we, each year we receive many, many applications from different infrastructures. So I wanted to ask you, how does this process work? How do you decide which infrastructures to include um, in the next SCOS pledging round? I can get us started. Thank you so much, Agata, for um, bringing us together. And <clears throat> thank you to the presentations we've seen today and for all of you for joining us. Um, Judy Rutenberg, the Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries. 
I'm so happy to be here um, as a member of the SAS board. So first, with respect to the vetting process, it is the, the sort of value proposition of SCOS is this extensive vetting. And so I, I also want to say congratulations to um, the infrastructures that were selected because it is quite a rigorous process. Um, as Agatha mentioned, there's an expression of interest that goes out and there's uh, the fourth one sounds like is out. Um, and this, um, the expression, the, the board works with an advisory group. So drawn from the members of SCOS, um, it is a, an advisory group of, of experts in, um, with policy expertise, technical expertise, financial ca um, cap capacities, um, that kind of thing. And they spend you know, maybe six to eight weeks evaluating the expression of interest applicants um, for, you know, for the kind of criteria that SCOS selects. Um, does the service a certain amount of years old? Um, you know, does it have a sustainability challenge? Is it a nonprofit associated with the research institution? Um, and uh, are the services of broad international relevance, which we've certainly seen here today? And then that's just the expression of interest, the full, um, the full evaluation that that advisory group um, does is, is again, you know, quite rigorous. And, you know, as each, I think, infrastructure demonstrated here today, um, really looking at the evaluation process really centers around the services value to its stakeholder communities. Um, so, uh, in, you know, funders, universities, libraries, authors, uh, researchers, the, you know, research managers, repositories, so kind of broad, um, broad value, um, looks at governance structure, um, costs and sustainability measures, and really, again, as each, um, I think, presentation here really underscored how these infrastructures fit within an open, sustainable, and fair landscape. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Susan to offer her thoughts on that. Nothing really to add. It, 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 the second, the second part of the process is an invited process as well. So we get expressions of interest and then um, narrow it down to say six, something like that. Um, and they are then, uh, they, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the, even the criteria, the form for applying and, and what we're asking has evolved uh, with time as we get more experience with this and realize what we need to know and what criteria matter and, and, and so on. So it's an evolving process, but it's a, um, it looks to not waste anybody's time, uh, uh, you know, um, but, uh, but also give us the information that we need. And then the, and then the the advisory committee recommends to the board. The board um, sort of really decides. It's a scored process anyway, so the board is really mostly deciding how many and and, and the sort of strategy of timing and and so on. So the the ultimate uh, goal is to have a judicious mix over time, you know, of of different kinds of offerings. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. And for this particular round, so for the third round, uh, what was the rationale behind uh, behind choosing these particular infrastructures? So archive, Redalic, America, and, and this space. Why them? Why not someone else? I, I don't know if you want me to go, Julie. I just, uh, what I would say is they come forward first. That's the one thing that, the, and then really it's on the quality, it's uh, on the nature of the need, the quality of the application, the value of the resource, and so on. So, and as I said, I think in this case, you know, we have we we, we have three different kinds of infrastructure doing different things in the ecosystem, and and I think we've been trying to do that as as well. Judy, absolutely. I mean, the strength of the applications. I think another thing that. Um, the SCOS board and advisory group and the, this kind of structure um, offers somewhat uniquely as a really international um, international body. So, I mean, I think the third round in particular, um, you know, this global community was looking at um, diversifying its offerings and really um, emphasizing those values of kind of uh, equitability. Um, that Agatha mentioned in the beginning. So, so yeah. thank you so much, uh, uh, and Susan. Uh, an additional question, especially for you, uh, because um, we just uh, recently heard about a very generous pledge coming from Canada, 
And that was, uh, that was actually the first consortium which pledged uh, for the third uh, SCOS uh, pledging ground. And I would like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about this specific pledge, but also um, perhaps more broadly about the role of consortia uh, in, in the pledging process for, for SCOS, as opposed to individual institutions pledging, pledging for them. Yeah, I, I'm happy to talk to that. I, my, so I'm, I'm executive director of CARL, Canadian Association of Research Libraries. And, um, and, and early on, I was contacted from SCOS and we, we looked at who, was, who had stepped forward for the pilot round and realized that there were some individual Canadian institutions had contributed. And we realized that uh, a collective effort would, um, you know, probably uh, get more commitment for sure, but it would also benefit from that 25% discount that was was there. So we, so luckily for us, our national consortium, CR, uh, CRKN, Canadian Research Knowledge Network, was willing to partner with us. And they basically do the administration of the pledging logistics. Um, they they get, gather the funds then and turn them onto, onto the infrastructure. Um, they do negotiations with the infrastructure because what what happens in our country, at least, is there is a tiered model at 13 tiers, and sometimes we want to make sure that we can have a graduated contribution. Uh, so the different, so a smaller institution can um, contribute less, uh, and and that is contributing to the whole, um, but it's not necessarily at that sort of 4,000 uh, euros mark, which is quite hard, steep for some. So. Um, so they so they uh, contribute according to that. It's opt-in. We have uh, 76 academic uh, libraries in this country, uh, about, uh, and about uh, 25 to 30 of them are typically choosing uh, uh, to contribute to one or other of these infrastructures over over all three rounds, or more. Uh, and uh, fundamentally, it's working very well. So over over the whole, uh, over all three rounds so far, um, Canada has contributed uh, um, seven hundred and twenty-five thousand U.S. dollars so far to the to the uh, to these different infrastructures, and we're proud of that. So they end up with a rolling list. Things go on. Things fall. You know, will stop eventually, or they will continue to have a funding relationship with these with these. Uh, uh, infrastructure. So I, I think it, it ended up being a win-win for everybody. Thank you so much, Susan. And yes, we are definitely very excited about this pledge and we hope that other consortia from other countries uh, will, follow, will follow this example. Um, I would now like to um, ask um, our infrastructures uh, a little bit more about their motivations behind um, applying to SCOS in the first place. Why, uh, why apply to SCOS? And um, I think that I am especially interested in perhaps Alison's answer to this, to this one, because Archive, has, Archive has a long history of, of existing in the, in the scholarly communication space. So why SCOS, why now? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, Archive did um, start a membership program, you know, about 10 years ago, and it very successful served its purpose um, with member engagement, um, the funding, we also have a, our major funder, the Simons Foundation um, matches member funds to a, um, to a certain level. And so that was great. However, as you could see from the graph <laughs> with our increasing submissions, we just, you know, we're looking at, we just celebrated our 30th anniversary and now we're looking ahead to the next 30 years and thinking, you know, this is not sustainable. Like we, we really have to <laughs> up our game um, a bit and, and, you know, um, and reach out to more institutions. Um, so, you know, for us, the SCOS, uh, the SCOS stamp of approval um, meant a lot to us. And, and we felt, um, yeah, we felt that really mattered um, around the world. We, um, we really appreciate your, um, your help and your networking. You know, you have a very strong network around the world. Um, and so that mattered to us. And, and I have to say also that um, this emphasis on consortia as members uh, really matters to small organizations. You know, we don't have a, a large administrative staff to reach out to each individual 
um, institution that's using archive around the world. So, so having the consortia help us with that um, is just hugely beneficial. So yeah, we're super grateful to SCOS and um, for all the, all the help that you're giving us. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Our our pleasure. I'm I'm glad that this discussion is uh, is starting to evolve around the role of consortia, because um, I think that uh, it's uh, it's a very relevant topic, and it seems that it's uh, a win win situation for the con from the consortia point of view and from from the infrastructure's point of view. Um, uh, Michele, from the, for, from the perspective of, of this space, what were your motivations to 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 apply for um, for SCOS um, campaigning? Um, I, I, I guess I won't be very original in my answer because it's very similar to what Alison just, just mentioned. Uh, because we need to look at the future and, uh, and we needed this space to get to the, to the next level. And in order to do that, uh, membership uh, support wasn't enough because we had to scale and be, really become a global organization. For many years, this space uh, uh, was global in terms of adoptions, less global in terms of outreach and activities. We need, we need to do that in order to, to really get closer to our community of users and support them. We, we needed some, we do, I mean, we need um, uh, to invest in, in technologies uh, and, 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 in, and improving the technology to, to really align with the next generation repositories guidelines, for example, and recommendations, uh, or with the interoperability issues that are out there. And, uh, we need to invest in technology and in development uh, in order to, to really address the new needs of the research uh, ecosystem that, that we are part of. And, um, and I would say it's also, it, it was also a matter of reputation. I mean, having this cost approval uh, about the, um, the, the, this space is one of the crucial pl platforms that, that the community might need or want to support was important for us uh, because it, it evolved in many different forms, this space, and now still out there is still the, the uh, most widely adopted repository. There's a reason for that for sure, but, 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 but we needed to know that this is actually true. So it was, it was very good for this reason as well. And you're giving us lots of new chances to, to do outreach and to, and to get to, to uh, institutions and consortia we, we didn't have a relationship with before. So uh, yeah, those are the reasons. Thank, yes, that answers my question. Thank you, Michaela. Um, speaking about scalability of, of, of your projects, and I think that that came through to me looking at all of your presentations, that uh, it seems that you are developing very, very fast. Um, and uh, looking at some of the slides that Ariana that you showed us, uh, the usage per day of Redalic America is just unbelievable, <laughs> millions of users. Um, so of course you you must be facing this these issues of, of scalability of, and of course of sustainability. So Ariana, you talked about about many different aspects of how you would like to use the funds coming from um, from the SCOS campaign. But among all of these sustainability issues, um, is there one of a particular importance for Redalic America, something which is the most urgent, urgent issue in your, um, in, in your opinion? Yes, thank you for the question, Agatha. Uh, well, I, I would give a, a little bit of context uh, be, because um, that perhaps it can be helpful, helpful to explain the um, increase in, uh, in our usage. Uh, so we decided that, uh, well, a couple of years ago that uh, due to the international context where we see every day that, you know, different commercial services are consolidating through uh, transformative agreements. And uh, now we are living also the inflationary context of APCs, the, the APC market. And so we decided to, uh, to take our services and to offer our services to uh, to really uh, reinforce uh, Diamond Open Access Journal. So, uh, in this sense, uh, we are investing um, a, a lot of efforts in order to uh, make Diamond Open Access also uh, more uh, professionalized and to uh, provide these services not only for end users to access and read the, the the journal articles, but also 
for uh, journals to produce their, their uh, journals. So this really impacted in our uh, capacity to, um, to, to provide the services. And uh, also the, 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 the circumstance that many journals are using exclusively our services to produce their journals. So in this sense, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we really need to, uh, to, to improve our services in terms of speed and availability in order to uh, help Diamond Open Access, in, in particular to the ones that we uh, index, this opportunity to keep operating with this business model and not to transform uh, their journals into APC. So are, we are very concerned about that. We are, we believe that we are really contributing to, uh, to avoid that uh, to happen. Uh, and I think this is uh, the, the big reason as well that uh, because we uh, participate uh, in this cause. So this is a key, uh, a piece in our vision to become a global initiative and to strengthen open access, diamond open access worldwide. Thank you for this answer, Ariana. And yes, you are definitely uh, contributing to uh, to you know spreading uh, diamond open access um, and uh, and raising awareness of of this business model. Uh, and making sure that people understand that there there is a, there is open access beyond APCs and and BPCs. Uh, so thank you, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, um, Alison, perhaps from your perspective, uh, what would you say is the most important uh, uh, issue at the moment that Archive is, is, uh, is facing in terms of sustainability? Where would you like to first uh, invest your first, your first money from the pledges? Where, where, will, where will it go? Yeah, it will definitely go to um, the behind the scenes <laughs> code improvements. Um, including moving to the cloud and um, and rewriting legacy code. Um, some of our, in fact, I mean, uh, a few years ago, like when we were hiring developers, it was difficult to find someone who even knew knew the old, you know, computer languages <laughs> uh, that some of the archive code is worked on, is, um, you know, written in. So, um, so that is absolutely the priority. Yeah. Okay, uh, understandable. Uh, Michele, what, what about this space? I would say that, uh, so as, as mentioned uh, in the slides, I mean, the, the big priorities are tools, the community management and, uh, and the development side. Um, uh, this space has um, a, a, a tech lead uh, for many years. Tim Donahoe has been leading the community in a fantastic way. The idea of of getting a junior developer will basically be to to do the kind of a, a behind the scene job that Alison was just mentioning, uh, to support the lead and the contributors and the committers to move things a little bit faster. And the part of the community is crucial uh, because it's related to what I was mentioning before: the fact that it's global, but but we don't have the capacity and resources to do the global outreach as we would love to. And, and so there's two aspects for a community-led uh, open source platforms uh, uh, broadly adopted are, are fundamental for us. So. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, to the audience, uh, you are welcome to ask questions um, as we go here. So um, please, uh, please do so, uh, put them in chat or just go ahead and just ask as a question. Uh, this is your chance to talk directly to, to our infrastructures here. Um, what I would like to ask about is the future um, uh, a little bit. Um, so uh, Ariana, you already shared uh, the vision for, uh, for Red Lake America. Um, Alison, where you would see archive beyond, beyond this cost campaign. So let's, let's assume very optimistically that you reach your target. And then, but what's next? What uh, what, what would be uh, what would be on your agenda next? Yeah, I think um, innovation and interoperability. Really thinking about um, how we connect to other services, um, how you know our place in the research um, in the research process. 
Um, because like I said, people right now sometimes post works in progress um, or you know early works and um, and some people post you know sort of deposit their finished product in in archives. So just thinking about that more deeply, um, I like what Michaela said about uh, uh, community engagement. We could definitely do a better job with community engagement. Um, there's we have a large community that's very interested in com in um, contributing their own code and we've done a little bit of that but with more capacity we could provide um, more services um, in fact uh, that is something maybe i'll put this link in the chat too sorry i keep <laughs> i keep posting links in the chat uh, but we have a framework called archive labs which is sort of like an ex where community members can say hey i have this great idea for us for a sort of a layer on top of archive like i want to try to integrate with you and so we have a process for that again right now it's very small we have very limited capacity to um to handle requests but there's more we could do with that absolutely thank you and feel feel free to to post as many links as possible actually i think that it's it's, it's quite helpful for everyone here um Michele, would you like to tell us where 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 do you where do you guys see this space in two three years so again uh, optimistically you reach your uh, scos uh, pledging target what happens next uh so i would say that the, the in in the ideal world um we'll be able to create uh, synergies with other open platforms to create an alternative to commercial players around the world to support uh, the research ecosystem um, and, uh, and, and, and to have all these space users around the world using the same version of this space. Uh, so that whenever we make a change, whenever we make an improvement, everyone can actually benefit from it and uh, and and everyone around the world is feeding back to to the governance with ideas thoughts participations and and the community move together so that's um, that's the vision it's not going to take two or three years maybe 20 30 who knows but at least we have a goal Thank you so much for sharing sharing all of these visions or all of these goals for, for the future. Uh, I think that they are more than, than inspiring. And since we are talking about the future and the goals uh, for the future, I actually also would like to ask the SCOS board members about the future, future vision for SCOS. So um, how do you see the role of SCOS in the next two, three years in terms of supporting open science infrastructure? Is there anything, any areas in particular that you would like to, to focus on? Uh, what's the vision for SCOS? Uh, well, we did just publish uh, the, um, our strategy for 2022 to 2024. So uh, I would refer anybody to that. Maybe we can put the link in the chat because uh, we did a, you know, a, a quite a thorough um, evaluation of the of the of the model, and um, by talking to uh, uh, community stakeholders as well as as infrastructures that had been, uh, uh, been part of the program, and and then we and then we had a, a very useful exercise to to lay out and and. and Figure out our, our strategy um, with a consultant who then who consulted quite widely and, and interviewed people and so on. It was a good process. And so what is there, I think, is a um, is a pragmatic strategy. It's um, it's it's kind of continue this model, evolve as needed, um, complement others. Um, I think at this point, for example, there can be confusion a little bit in terms of is invest in open a different undertaking as an example and you know how do they relate to each other and and we have talked about that and sort of realize how they can be complementary and and they're doing different things in different ways so SCOS being really about the money you know and getting getting a, a developmental hurdles over overcome uh, some seed investment, for example, as transition happens and so on. Whereas I think IOI at this point is, is kind of investing in trying to sort what the community and what's needed, get community engagement, understand uh, the, 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 I see they've launched a catalog of 
of uh, open resources. So things like that are important as well. So I think at this point we see uh, roles for both and we see uh, very much that SCOS uh, has a role to play still for the foreseeable future. Yes, I would agree um, with, with all of that. Um, also the work, you know, connect that SCOS does connecting these infrastructures to um, to new communities of support um, through even through something like we've done this morning, I think is um, tremendously beneficial. And and you know another you know one of the kind of values that really came out of the report and consultation process that Susan described um, was how important it was that SCOS focuses on infrastructures that are important to the research community. Um, so they're important to the research community and the the groups that are investing in them, the you know, where the money is coming from is because their researchers are invested in those, in those infrastructures. And so I think that data, that continuous community engagement, the focus on global interoperability, all of that is, you know, echoes what the infrastructures themselves are working towards. So it's a pretty great partnership. Can I just add, I, I wouldn't mind adding just what I sort of see as, as making sense in terms of the investment landscape going for, I don't, I, it seems to me that, that ultimately what you want is is to be as a country i'm thinking sort of as canada for example you want to be investing internationally um, trying to uh, nurture an open infrastructure uh, as a as a slice of the whole investment that you have to make in resources and some of it that is towards open but not all of it of course so so it becomes almost a um a, you know, a, it's a kind of a collections decision in some ways, and, and I and I think uh, what we're looking to see is a little bit of a shift over, so that more institutions see the value of a modest investment um, outside, you know, to the international good, um, and, and it doesn't need it, it will grow and it should grow, I hope, but it's not growing to ever to be the only thing, you know. So I think it's a sort of um, it's almost stable. And the question is using that to say it's 10% or something, I, it's using that to the best effect. So the most necessary infrastructure you have the greatest need, that is part of what the, the, the art is, I think, over time. Thank you so much, Susan. I mean, that was that was a great wrap up of, of, of the session, uh, so to speak. Um, I, I had some last word prepared, but perhaps now it's not it's not needed. Um, but just to um, just to sum sum up this session, because um, I don't see any any more questions coming unless someone would still like to to ask a question, then please go ahead. Um, but um, I think that one more thing that um, really uh, was quite present in all of these presentations and also in, in the conversation that we just uh, had was that you were uh, referring to a sort of behind the scenes. So what happens behind the scenes? And I think that very often open science infrastructure is actually this kind of invisible actor that we don't think about all that often. It is behind the scenes. And I think that what SCOS is trying to do is to put Put it in a spotlight um, as something which is worth uh, worth investing in. Um, so uh, again, um, please do consider pledging for our infrastructures here. Um, we would be more than grateful for your support. Um, you can contact uh, our infrastructures directly. You can also contact us as SCOS. So me personally as as SCOS coordinator. Um, we will release a recording of this uh, of this webinar, and we will also share all the slides, so you will have all the information, all the contact information, all sorts of um, you know pledging targets for for each infrastructure. Um, if you would like to invite uh, your colleagues from Europe uh, to to join a similar webinar, we will have one more session on the 18th of March. Uh, this time focused specifically on Europe uh, with also with the SCOS board members this, this time coming from Europe and talking to you a little bit more about the European, the European context. Um, I think that this is, this is, is, this is it for, for today. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you all for, for talking to us, for presenting your infrastructures and uh, for uh, quite an inspiring discussion that we had here today. 
So thank you again. And I hope to see some of you or some of your colleagues uh, for the next webinar this time um, focused on Europe. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.